share with us a little bit today. So would you guys welcome Dave as he comes up here today? Good morning. Awesome. So uh, in accordance with uh, last week and what we were talking about, which was being faithfully prepared and introducing this idea of being, having Jesus at the center, that was our vision point um, as we see the, the banner up here. Um, how are you, and uh, I, I, I know this is a loaded question because I already know the answer in a lot of ways, how are you faithfully preparing and practicing putting Jesus at the center of your lives, knowing that th th when we did this message about how, how we how we fill our lives up and what we fill our lives up first, how that impacted you. Well, when we first saw this message, um, well, kind of what you said about how to have Jesus at the center when, when you really feel what he does, and, uh, and I definitely did through the past few years of my life, um, it just really spoke to me in the way that I, already, it, I was already trying to do that. Mm -hmm. But what I really liked about this message was the idea of um, really setting aside a time to shut everything off, um, the, uh, the clothes for business. And um, so after that service, you know, my son and I, um, I, I was always praying while I was driving. Um, God worked in my life really strongly in the past four, four years of my life and, uh, and my son's life as well. And um, so after this message, I went back home and I was talking to my son, I said, you know, we, we do prayer time and, and we take time with God, but let's, uh, let's do a close for business. Let's do, you know, first to start off 8.30 because he was, he was younger, but um, now we do 9.30 because I also work on a couple of evenings. So at 9.30, phones get shut off and either we'll watch a message, um, you know, uh, or read from the Bible. A lot of times we read from the Bible, we pray. We just take time to be 100% with God. And, um, and what that started doing for me in my life was just throughout the day I was I, I'm a personal trainer at the YMCA and, and my own business too and I just found myself praying for people you know hearing a story or something and, and it was just him kind of God like touching me like hey you know I'm here I'm here and um, so and it was kind of funny because as we were talking about before a lot of people, um, you know, being a personal trainer and everything, sometimes people get like misconceptions or something. And and uh, in talking with people, they they realize, you know, I was very devout. And um, and it was funny because I was a professional motorcycle rider for years, and, and a lot of other stuff. And people that knew me were like, "Wow, you know, I, I was never a bad guy or anything." But it's like, "Wow, you really changed. Like, you're really focused on God, and um, you know, it's it, like you're serious about that." <laughs> and I, yeah, I'm, I'm serious about God, yeah. you know, and, yeah. uh, and seeing what it's done for my son as well. And, you know, him talking to me about wanting to, to be closer to God. But he, um, and I hope I'm not embarrassing him when I say this, he says, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like I, I don't, I'm not there, right? And, uh, and I told him, I'm like, you know, God says if you seek him with all your heart, you'll find him. Yeah. And he, he went to camp. And he came back and he's like, you know, I think I haven't been seeking him with all my heart and now I really want to. Oh, praise God. So, yeah, That's so awesome. it's, it's been really cool to, uh, to kind of be taking those times to, to put Jesus at the center yeah. and seeing what he does when you do that. Yeah. And uh, the comfort and everything, because, um, you know, it's only me and Seth. So what's happened through that and the, the, the pain of what happened before and everything, yeah. that being diminished through, through Christ and uh and just kind of seeing hope for the future because yeah. if it wasn't for my son yeah i wouldn't be here yeah so um you know and we were both baptized we actually just found our um our baptism uh papers a couple of days ago and we framed them and he got to pick out some nice frames and everything and they're That's awesome they're on our house so it's he's really worked in our lives and uh it's easy to make him the center yeah. when when you really just let it happen yeah amen and and, and as you do Jesus kind of becomes Grand Central Station. I love that comment that people were like, you're really serious about this, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so let me pray for you because I am serious. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty awesome. Would you guys thank David for joining us and sharing with us today? Thank you, man. Appreciate you, buddy. But we're glad you're joining us today. And, and as we move into this thing, we want to remind you of where we've been so far. In the first building principle we talked about uh, in, in, there in the, at the end of July was this idea that we need to take this thing to God in prayer. When God breaks our hearts, 
um, and, and, he, and, he, and he shows us what's breaking his. He calls us to himself and we need to take it to God in prayer. And then the second building principle last week was that we always need to be faithfully prepared. And, um, you know, he's preparing his family, Dave is. And so I love that story about what that looks like. And then this vision point for us today or yes, last week as we, as we think about Jesus being at the center of our, of our lives and what that looks like as well. And then today's vision point, and I don't know if you can grab that for us or not, but um, today's vision point is, is this idea that we need, and, and, he, and he mentioned this, Dave did, and this is really a great thing, and that was that, that we can live distinctly and have that distinction be attractive. Do you guys hear that? Yeah, no, it's right, right there, it's fine. Or, or up here, yeah, that's great, here. Just right there, perfect. Awesome. So, um, our lives can be lived in such a way when we put Jesus at the center that that living is distinct, distinctly godly, but is also attractive. It's not always popular, is it? But it's always attractive to a world that needs to see a pure, authentic faith worked out and a salvation worked out in front of them. And then you get responses like he did. Oh, you're serious about this. And they can see the evidence of that. So that's what we're going to talk about today is this idea that we can live distinctly and attractively. And it says in Romans, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. That's, that's the thing right there, right? That we're, that we're actually supposed to live a new life in Christ. That, that that life can be distinct as we live it for God. It's a new, fresh life for Him. So when we say living distinct and attractive, this is what we mean right here. Somebody say new lives. We have new lives. John Mark Comer, he's an author of, of, of the, this book right here, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, and another one that's, that's out now called uh, Live No Lies, has been quoted as saying, and I think this is so true, that the Christian church when we think of ourselves uh, and, and how dangerous we might feel like culture is or the society around us, he actually says we're actually more dangerous, not in the negative sense, but the positive sense, than the culture is around us. He says he, that, that, that he always has to be careful in his city, which is Portland, not to live a survivalist spirituality. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Where you kind of hunker down and you make the focus not letting the big bad world get you. And, and, and you just take care of your own. And we have to not let the enemy trick us into thinking that survival is the only litmus test for success. You, you got through. Good job. Give yourselves a hand, right? You got here this morning, right? Sometimes that's how we feel. And sometimes that's reality. And, but, but, but your whole life lived that way. It's just not what God had intended when he said that you have been raised to new life. That you can live a new life in Christ now. We need to actually think, John Mark Comer says, like the early church. They didn't just think how we're going to be harassed and, and, and how we can just hold on to the persecution and survive. No, they actually took a different viewpoint and stance. They thought, we're going to spread the gospel one meal at a time over bread and wine. Yes, wine. Sorry, Wesleyans. Even if it costs us our life. We're going to do this. We're going to live together. We're going to figure out what living this new life in Christ looks like together over meals. And we're sharing with one another, even if it costs our life. And we're going to see the world come to know that Jesus is Lord. And, 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 and Pastor Josh, as he was leading us in prayer this morning, said this. We don't, we, we run on Jesus. We don't run on Duncan, right? <laughs> we run on Jesus Christ at the center of our lives. And that's not a survivalist spirituality. That's actually a resurrection spirituality. And, and I think we can be prone to a survivalist spirituality, especially when we're tired and we're coming up out of COVID and there's a lot of controversy going on right now. And we have to be, and really what that controversy does, especially I've been thinking about this. When we, when we got into COVID and we all hunkered down into our own little worlds in our homes, keeping ourselves safe, which was the proper thing to do at the beginning, all we did probably was watch TV and look at our phones and think about that world, it began to define how you thought and how you lived your life, right? 
The things that you were pouring into your, to your soul, whether you knew it or not, were beginning to define how you looked at the whole world. And, and though there's controversy around us, we have to be careful that we don't lose hope. That we can be a hopeful Christian, and hope is the expectation of coming good based on the person and the promises of God. It's, a, it's hope for things not yet seen. We want to be hopeful Christians. Here's what it also does not mean. We're not interested in trying to coerce or control people to believe, right? So what is the difference? What's the alternative to that? It's that we live in a way that begs the question like he got. Oh, you're serious about, are you serious about this thing? And then you want to invite people to join you in that community. Could you be able to live this new life in Christ in a way that is so distinct that it's attractive to someone? They ask the question, what, it is, what is it about you? And then you just invite them in to live it along with you. That's the scenario. And that's what we need to get our heads around today as we think about living distinct and attractive. That, that your life could be so refreshingly distinct that people want in. It's, it's an example and an invitation. Michael Green from Oxford in his book on evangelism in the early church basically sums up a couple hundred page academic study of early Christianity and, and says basically that this right here, what we've been talking about, is how evangelism worked in the early church. The church was living a radically different and compelling life, and then pagans, it's a really fancy word for unbelievers, were so captivated by this. Think about this. They're so captivated and then compelled by how they were living this way of life, this way of Jesus, that then the Christians just said, hey, if you want to join us, you're welcome to, and they did. And I think we're there again to a place where you'll just live your life for God in such a distinct, godly way, not against somebody else, but for God, that it'll be so attractive, not always popular, it's so attractive, people will go, what is that? And you just go, hey, if you want to join me, come on. Let me show you what it looks like. That was basically how evangelism worked in the early church. It wasn't a digital marketing strategy for Jesus. It wasn't massive events. I mean... The whole thing was illegal and persecuted at the beginning. It, wasn't, it was just this beautifully compelling alternative way of life that hundreds of millions of people and now billions of people have found to be the truest way of life that there is. So living for Jesus as Lord in a distinct way, some people have phrased it this way, is a beautiful resistance. Not because not you're against anyone, but because you're, you're, you're resisting that culture and the circumstances around us would define who you are and how you live your life. But you are actually, in a beautiful way, resisting that. Living with people is what we want who are devoted to Jesus as Lord, for whom obedience to Jesus is the foundation of their life. You know how this distinction comes in your life is that you learn to obey. And you learn to trust. None of us, you know, live out that entirely, but that it would be for all of us as we gather together in this family, the deepest desire of our hearts that we're attempting to live into and become a part of. And I think the more that we can build a community around the obedience of Jesus, the more beautiful and compelling that resistance will actually become, the more of a contrast community it will be. You guys, you guys following me here? You, you tracking with me on this? For so long we've made Christianity this against the world thing. And there are forces against us. And the world is one of them. Let, 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 let's not mistake that. But how we live our lives in orientation to this big bad world is not the life that Christ died for you to live. He wanted to live so beautifully, distinctly for him that it just becomes attractive for others. And the irony of, of church strategies all, 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 all throughout history on both the left and the right 
is that they would attempt to accommodate to the culture. But see, what happens is, when that happens, it, it, some, some of these historians have said it, they kind of signed their own death wish, if you will, because there's nothing that would make you join them. You know what I mean? Like, like here's the thing. Why join them when I can go to brunch on Sunday morning? Why, why submit my sexuality or my money or whatever when I can just do whatever I want with my body and my money? As long as it's legal, right? And you hear that because that's, that's defined by the society. If it's legal, it's okay. There has to be something more beautiful about our lives, about what I'm joining into than what I'm actually leaving behind. For a long time, the church hasn't placed in front of the world something more beautiful and distinct. And I think that beauty, it comes from us obeying. Trusting Jesus with our whole lives and allowing him to dictate how our lives are lived. So how do I live my life and why do I live it that way? Have you ever asked that question? Why do I live the way I live? What, what controls those decisions? So I want to give a seven, and there are obviously more, seven distinct calling card marks of a beautiful resistance that Scripture has for us. We're calling this living distinct and attractive. This is what it is, okay? The first one is this. Don't, don't play around with sin. Don't play around with it. So one of the first things that, 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 that God set up with the Israelites is that there are things that you can do and there's things that you sh definitely should not play with. And it was always for their good, right? It was always so that they kept, Jesus, or kept God first in that moment and that, that they lived their lives with him at the center. So I just want to read to you how Nehemiah uh, uh, got into this. And so he, he, he says at the beginning of chapter 13 in his thing is that actually what happened is he had, he had left. It was 12 years after he had gone to Jerusalem. He had actually gone back to Babylon, and he wasn't in Jerusalem at this time, and he found out, verse 4 of chapter 13, before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. He was one of the enemies, by the way, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites. So, just, he, he was in charge of a lot of stuff, the musicians, the gatekeepers, all of that, as well as the contributions for the priests. So he's in charge of so much stuff that's coming into the temple, okay? He's kind of like the treasurer, the overseer of these things. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 30, 32nd year of Artaxerxes, so he left in the 20th, he, he's in the 32nd year now, 12 years later, the king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission, and he... Came and, and, and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. You say, well, that doesn't seem so bad. But he let the enemy in, into a place that God said was holy. Verse 8, I was greatly displeased and through all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. So in other words, he, he gave Tobiah a, a storage facility that was meant to be a holy place. You say, well, what's so big about that? Because that's a lot, a lot of times what we ask in our society today. What's the, what's the problem? It's not being used for that. Well, cause it, it's, you know why? It's because God said to and oftentimes when we begin to play and get used to and comfortable with, 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 with the gray areas and sinful things, it has a hard, harsh consequence on our lives. I also, verse 10, learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So in other words, they weren't being taken care of, so they didn't have anybody to sing and to lead worship anymore. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah and the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan, son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, that, just, oh, that man, their assistant. Why couldn't they just say Joe and Rick and... 
because they were considered trustworthy. He put them in charge. They were made responsible for dis distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. Sometimes we play around with things that God says that's not for your good and it ends up hurting other people. So the number one thing that can ha be distinct about a life lived for God is that we don't play around with sin. We don't play around with things that when God says to do it because it's holy, there's a reason for that and it's a, it's a trust thing. So that's number one. Number two, a positive lifestyle of holiness. A positive lifestyle of holiness. I have a couple of scriptures on the screen here for you. And, and, and I've memorized Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, which is my life verse differently, but I love this one for its nuance. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in what? The way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And, and walk as ch dearly loved children in the, in the way of love. That, that is that, again, positive orientation, a positive lifestyle, walking in a way of love that is, that is holy. Because God is holy and God is love. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In other words, this way of life is becoming an apprentice to the way of Jesus. And the way of Jesus is exactly what it says. It's a way of life. It's not just a, a set of ideas or Bible uh, and theology, list of do's or don'ts. No, it's, an, it's not an ethical kind of moral vision. It, it is those things, but it's so much more. It, 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 it's also a lifestyle of apprenticing under Jesus himself. It's like, organ, this is it. It's like organizing your lifestyle around following him. That's what's going to be distinct and attractive to the world. That you would buy in so much that they go, you're serious about this. Because you're organizing your life. Do you hear what he did? Faithfully preparing himself. The, there was a close for business sign on the door at 930 so they could meet with Jesus. That's what it means to organize yourself and your lifestyle around the way of Jesus. To let yourself slow down and simplify and move your body even into a lifestyle where apprenticeship to Jesus is the organizing principle. Number three, distinct and attractive means caring for others in need as if they were Jesus. As if they were Jesus. Jesus is telling us in Matthew chapter 25, that the, people, that, 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 that the people that a distinction will be made between people who cared for others around them and those who didn't. He shares a story about the sheep and the goats being separated, and he looks to the sheep and he says, come in, he says. Um, then the, the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father. And he tells them why, for I was this. He, this is the distinction, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed or invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Something that will be distinctly attractive in our world today is that we followed these simple guidelines. This is where we get this idea that we, you might be entertaining an angel God himself, in the way that you treat others, even if you don't know that's a, that's a God-ordained moment. You, if you can live your life for God, if you orient your life and, and, and your lifestyle to a way of God and a way of life that is a, a dearly loved children living this Jesus life, you begin to care for people as if they were Jesus. You begin to tell yourself, G Jesus did this as if he was caring for his own. He, he, he loved people, and, and we're going to get into how he did that. There is an unhurried presence of, about his life that, that I want to get into. But number four, 
Another way that, that, that living distinctly becomes attractive, it means this, being salt and light. Being salt and light. Now, I want to get to Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to read a different version of this in just a second, but I want you guys to hear this. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under fr- underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, being a seasoning and a light to the world, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's that same idea, right? You live your life in such a distinct way that it brings seasoning and and, and and enlightenment to people around you just by way you live, just by your sheer example of caring for others, of not playing around with sin, of calling sin, sin, even if it doesn't make sense to those around you. You live your life that way. And he says, you, if you let your light shine that way, people will see those good deeds and they will do what? Glorify your father in heaven. It's a wonderful thing being salt and light. I, I want to take you to a parallel version in, 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 the, in the Gospel of Mark because the nuance of salt is explained by Jesus in a unique way. I want you to hear this. Mark chapter 9, verse 49. Everyone will be salted with fire. In other words, there's a purification to salt. If salt is good, he says, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves. You're going to be salted with fire. In other words, there's a purification, but there's a, there's a salt that needs to come in the midst of yourselves. And then he says this, this is what it looks like, and be at peace with each other. So as, as God works on our hearts, our, our goal is that we would bring each other together and that we would have peace amongst us. So there's this, there's this idea of, of purification and friendship that we have in, 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 in salt, that, that it helps us. It, it not only seasons and purifies our hearts and lives, but it also seasons our interactions with other people around us. I love that. Colossians actually tells us that our actions and words should be seasoned as well with salt. Listen to what it says. Pray that, okay, he says in verse five, be wise in the way you act toward other outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Such a, such a wonderful thing. What we're talking about here, distinction, is being salt and light. Number five, it's the, it, it means the fruit of the Spirit is produced in you. It's a distinction of our lives. That, that, that the actual fruit of the Spirit would be produced in us. L- look at this, if you would, with me. Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, is what this version says. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I was told, and maybe I'll do this, because oh, I won't be here in second service, but uh, Todd said he, he missed one of those each time. I think it was gentleness. And the, and, the, and the youth always got on him. So he, he said, make sure you say all of them. He says, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, right? So we died in baptism, right, as we went in, right? But now we come to new life in Christ. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. How do you keep in step with the Spirit? Will you make Jesus the sinner? And you set your lifestyle around doing what he did. And that's what it means he gives us the Holy Spirit to keep in step with him in those ways. And what happens is the fruit, it's not your fruit, it's, it's God's fruit, it's the Spirit's fruit, gets produced in you. And you don't even have to do it. You just keep yourself in, in line with Jesus and keep him at the center and, 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 and trust him and do what he says and don't play around with sin and care for others. And, and things in you will be produced that are godly. It's just that simple, isn't it? And, and that will be so distinctly God to other people that it'll be attractive to them. And they will call the question. Number six. 
is that we know the truth and we're honest. I had a professor used, that used to say this in 10 years, and this was over 10 years ago. In 10 years, all you'll need to do is not tell a lie, and that'll separate you from other people. That sounds funny, but it's kind of true, isn't it? You look around you and you're like, who's telling the truth? Who's even telling the truth anymore? I don't know which end is up. That you would just not tell a lie. And you would just, and, but, but here's the question. How do we know what a lie is if we don't know what the truth is? You say, well, that's a silly question, but it's actually a really deep question. How do you know what a lie is anymore versus the truth if you don't know what the truth is? So John 8, 32 tells us, Jesus himself, if you hold to my teaching, if you center yourself around me and my teaching and, you, and you, you apprentice under me, you are really my disciples. Then you will what? Know the truth and the truth will do something wonderful. It sets you free. What does it set you free from? Not just sin, but, but knowing what it looks like around you. Hearing the voice of the one who is truth. Recognizing that in that truth, as you live your life out with that truth, it actually changes you from the inside out. It sets you free not just from the power of sin, but it helps you keep your head about what is true and what is not. It, it becomes that navigation system in you. And does wonderful things. But you have to know the truth. And you have to be honest. Okay? And, and last thing, number seven. This is the one I want to talk about about Jesus. It means having an unhurried presentness. So what is that? Well, we're reading as a, as a staff this book, The Ruthless Elim Elimination of Hurry. We started it a long time ago, and then uh, Easter hit, and then summer hit. and So we're getting back into it again. But, but as he describes Jesus in this way of life, and it's called slow down spirituality, you'll hear us mention that here and there. It's this idea that there is a rule of life that, that, that we, can, we can govern ourselves with that is centered around the teachings of Jesus and the life of Jesus, this way of life that Scripture has been talking to us about today. And, and here's the thing about Jesus. He was never, ever in a hurry. Right? Like frustratingly so for some. He, was never, he seemed to always be present in that moment. Willing to say no to a lot of other things in order to be fully present with the person or people he was with. Let me give you an example. Every, and by this, everyone was worthy of his presence, of his attention. He's on the way to heal Jairus' daughter. Remember this story? Someone touches his cloak, he turns around and says, power came out of me, who was that? But he wasn't just okay with identifying the person after they came out of the crowd. It says that Jairus was sitting over there looking at his watch going, how much more of this woman's story are you going to listen to? My daughter's dying. You remember this, right? So frustrating to Jairus in the moment that he was coming with him. But in that moment, she needed him not just to heal her, but to listen to her and to validate her, her being in that moment. She had been unseen and untouchable for so long. And Jesus, in that moment of unhurried presentness, changed her life, gave her identity back, gave her dignity back. Jesus was never in a hurry. Everyone in front of him was worthy to be paid attention to. We need to develop the ability to love like Jesus loved. You can only do that by keeping him at the center and, and, and organizing your life around his way of life so that we can be unrushed the way he was unrushed so that we can also be present. How hard is it? I accidentally left my phone in my pocket and it went off three times while I was doing this interview with David. Like, what am I doing with my phone on the stage? How many times have you gotten distracted with this? And it comes out and you're, and you're doing this. I'm guilty just like you. And, and what all these things do to us is they don't organize us enough to be unrushed. They actually make us more rushed and more busy. 
and feel like we have to do things quicker for everyone. That everything, everyone's urgency is my emergency. Or the other way around. Everyone's emergency is my urgency. Let me ask you a question. If you could eliminate just 10% of the hurry in your life, how much more present could you be in the right places? Think about that. If you could figure out how to eliminate... And you say, well, that, I, I could just do it. No, you, can't. you have to actually practice this. You have to actually physically figure out how much time you spend on your phone or watching TV. And you'll, you'll figure out, I don't, some, a lot of people say, I don't have time for something like that. Just, just track your week and how you spend it and look and have an honest evaluation of that. And, and just, you'll, you'll realize there's a lot more time than you think. If you could eliminate 10% of that hurry in your life, you guys, everyone knows what I'm talking about when I say that. How much more present could you be in the right places and the right people? It would change your life. It would change your life. To be, and that unhurried presentness that could come with Jesus at the center would be so distinct in our culture today that it will be attractive. Right? It won't always be popular because you're not always on social media doing all the, you know, the dances and, the, the, you know, spouting off about whatever political opinion you have and writing, writing posts based on memes. All that might, some of that may go away, but you'll be so presently unhurried with the people in front of you. It, 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 it'll be attractive. This is just a small picture of what it looks like to live in such a way that it's distinct and attractive. A beautiful resistance. Again, it's not always popular, but it is always attractive. As the team comes up, uh, I, I was reading another article, and I'm just going to close with this because this is very interesting to me. There are five features. Anybody like Timothy Keller? He is a great author, a wonderful pastor. He said, there are five features that made the early church unique. And he says, I think we can learn from them today. And what's interesting about these five features is that a couple of them, and I'm just going to, we're just going to put this out there. It's not a political statement, it's just a reality. A lot of these features of the early church, some of them we'd say are, are, are very conservative values today. And a couple of them are very liberal values today. And one of them just everyone shares together. All right, so listen to these things real quick as we think about how we're going to respond today. He said, Christianity brought into human thought for the first time the concept that, that you chose your religion regardless of your race and class. Christianity also radically asserted that your faith in Christ become your new deepest identity while at the same time not affecting, uh, not facing or wiping out your race, class, or gender. Instead, he said, your relationship to Christ demoted them, all of those things, to second place. This meant to the shock of the Roman society at the time that all Christians, whether slave, free, highborn, or whatever their race and nationality, were now equal in Christ. This was a radical challenge to the entrenched social structure and divisions of Roman society. And from it, from this distinct, attractive living that they had, it flowed at least five unique features. One, the early church was multiracial and experienced unity across ethnic boundaries that was startling. Throughout the book of Acts, we see remarkable unity between people of different races. Ephesians 2 is a testimony of and the importance of racial reconciliation as the fruit of the gospel. Number two, the early church was a community of forgiveness and reconciliation. Christians were often excluded and criticized, but they were also actively persecuted and imprisoned and attacked and killed. Nevertheless, they, they taught forgiveness and withheld retaliation against opponents. In a shame and honor culture which, in which vengeance was expected, this was unheard of and it changed the society around them. Number three, the early church was famous for its hostility, hostility hospitality to the poor and suffering. They weren't hostile to them. It was expected to care for the poor of one's family or tribe, but the Christian promiscuous help was given to all poor, even of other races and religions, as taught in Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. It was unprecedented. During the urban plagues, it was said that Christians characteristically didn't flee the cities, but stayed and cared for the sick and dying of all groups. It was, it was world-changing. Number four, it was a community 
committed to the sanctity of life. It, was, it wasn't simply that Christians opposed abortion, that was dangerous and relatively rare in their time, but a more common practice was called infant exposure. Unwanted infants were literally thrown onto garbage heaps to either die or be taken by traitors into slavery and prostitution. And it was the Christians that saved the infants and took them in. Lord, would you mark us as people so distinctly for you that we would do such radical things in the face of culture and it would be a beautiful resistance, not against people, but for you, for the sanctity of others, God. Jesus. Number five, and I won't get into all the details of this, but it was a sexual counterculture. So it was, it was insisted that married women, married women of social status abstain from sex outside of marriage, but it was expected that men, even married men, would have sex with anyone of lower status with them. And it was, it was not only allowed, it was regarded as unavoidable. And the Christian church came in and said, sex in the culture was always considered an expression of one's social status, but here, it's not just going to be an appetite, but a way to give oneself wholly to another and in so doing, imitate and connect to the God who gave himself in Christ. It treated all people as equal and it rejected the double standards of gender and social status. I'm just, those are just five ways that the early church was so distinct and attractive because they lived their lives with Jesus the sinner. They made him the one who set the pace for their lives and they lived their life as a way of life just like Jesus did. And it literally, without him having to be there, changed their whole society. We need to be people who live distinct and attractive in our world today. They need to see something different. It needs to be more beautiful than what they're leaving. And it will, it will change the world, people, I'm telling you. So here's your take home today. By the way, John Wesley did this with his evangelistic preaching and his radical communal discipleship. He did it. He was so for God that he literally fashioned his whole life around it. It's called Methodism for a reason. He had a method and it looked like madness to the world, but it changed people's lives. It's a radical choice to follow Jesus' way into a positive lifestyle of holiness and care for others. It, 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 in other words, it's, not, it's the dog wagging the tail, not the other way around. And Jesus being the center of our attention and life, and that informing our engagement of the world is distinct and attractive. So here's the questions. For whom do you live your life? How do you live your life and why? Why do you live that way? If you could take this conversation home with those questions and begin to talk about them, that would be really awesome. But let's sing this song as we leave today, and I'll pray for us before we leave.